what everybody says about you. Chair, and I recognize Jen Lee from New Jersey. Ms. Cheryl, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you both for being here today to testify in this important hearing. I have a, a broad question um, about the kind of good news and bad news in the Indo-PACOM, and then I'll turn it over to both of you to respond. Um, as our national defense strategy states, conflict with the PRC is neither inevitable nor desirable. I think every member of this committee would agree that uh, and share my belief that the most desirable outcome of our policy towards the PRC would be to deter them from taking aggressive actions to achieve uh, their ambitions. But innovation and modernization are not the only tools we have. It's clear one of our main advantages is our alliances and security partnerships, and that's clear from the PRC's transparent efforts to undermine those partnerships and to use its influence and strength to coerce neighbors in the region. Just in the past month, the Philippines announced a landmark agreement that will expand U.S. military presence there and strengthen U.S.-Philippines military cooperation. A striking contrast to our relations of even three years ago when the previous Filipino administration threatened to end our visiting forces and enhanced defense cooperation agreements. In 2021, we inaugurated the AUKUS Agreement, which will strengthen one of our oldest partnerships in the Indo-PACOM AOR, and we're seeing Japan increase its defense spending by 50%. So, Admiral Harris, Dr. Sisson, could each of you give me your views of the best next steps to build on the successes of the last two years in re-strengthening our partnerships in the Indo-PACOM AOR? And conversely, where are those major fault lines in the region? What are the overt pressure mechanisms, economic or military, that the CCP can apply to our allies and partners? And what are the covert behind the curtain mechanisms? And how can we mitigate that risk? Thank you, and I'll turn it over to both of you. I think that's a very good description of the, the big picture view of what's happening regionally. Um, I think that, uh, the national defense strategy made an important stride this cycle by including the idea of campaigning, which is not unrelated to the agreements that you've just highlighted in the Philippines, which is to say a particular kind of presence and activity on the part of our military forces to be more uh, available and vigilant in the surrounding waters, which is important to those allies and partners and, and other nations in that region. The other way in place that we can continue to uh, create some space for, for these nations is through engaging with them on other sources of national power, like trade, primary among them. Um, we have concerted diplomacy and that should continue. And ideally what we'll do best is listen to what they are telling us about what it is that they need and they want as they pursue, as the Admiral put it, their own enlightened self-interest. Thanks. Uh, I think that, as I've said before, diplomacy and diplomats matter. Uh, and the fact that we haven't had an ambassador uh, to India in over two years matters to the Indians. Uh, we shouldn't be surprised that they're not as supportive uh, of Ukraine as we would like them to be. Uh, it took us five years, five years, to put an ambassador uh, in ASEAN. Uh, do we think that the Southeast Asian countries didn't uh, notice that? Uh, it took us five years to get an ambassador to Singapore uh, and all the good things that Singapore does for us and for the joint force. Uh, and China fills those vacuums. Uh, you know, it took 18 months to get an ambassador to, to replace me. Uh, Philip Goldberg is fabulous. I mean, the, the Koreans certainly traded up, but they shouldn't have had to wait for 18 months uh, to get one. Right? It took 18 months to get Carolyn Kennedy down to Australia. Australia. 18 months to get an ambassador to Australia. And that's on us, uh, the United States. Uh, and, and some people say it's, uh, it's a manifestation of the divided political landscape in Washington. Uh, but, and, uh, but I've said that you can't criticize the United States Senate if the White House doesn't nominate people in a timely fashion. Now, we're further along now than we've been. Uh, you know, we're over two years in. Uh, but still, there are holes out there that need to be filled, must be filled, uh, it took us three years to get an ambassador to Ukraine, you know, and, and uh, thank goodness that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, we, we had an ambassador in, in, in Russia, uh, uh, John Sullivan, that he agreed to stay over uh, into this administration. Uh, he had to leave because his wife died. I'm so, so sorry about that. And so right now, Russia is gapped. 
So that's on us uh, and, and not taking diplomacy uh, to the level that it needs to be, which affects our relationships with these countries, uh, whether they're with us or against us. General Lee's time's expired. Chair, I recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Jackson, for five minutes. 